an unreported world, the biggest exodus of migrants on Earth, where Venezuelan teenagers are having to fend for themselves. I follow the journeys of teenagers who make it to Colombia only to get lost in the border towns with no documents and few ways to make any money. It isn't what they hoped for, but it's still better than the life they left behind. We're on the edge of no man's land, where, for millions of people, smugglers' tracks are the only way to escape Venezuela. A Colombian border patrol has just arrived. Well, that's interesting. The soldiers here seem to have sent those people back. I can actually see people walking back along the track. They've obviously seen the soldiers here. Yeah, gunfire. The border patrol are holding back a large group of refugees. Is it okay if we go and talk to those people? That's it. Are you hoping they will let you through? What is the problem with your baby? Was she in the children's hospital in Caracas? Because I went there two years ago and there were real problems back then. It must be much worse now. I watched children die in that hospital because of a shortage of basic supplies. What will you do now? I think, I think they're just going to go and try and plead with the soldiers to let them through because the situation of some of those at the front is really bad. If Rizma doesn't get to help in Colombia, her baby Ruth isn't going to make it. Aquí, para que me haga 18 es tan amable para verificar aquí una situación de una gran cantidad de personas migrantes y uno puede estar acá tan gero. We wait for 20 minutes. Then, quietly, the soldiers let them in. Have they let you through? They said, said yes? OK. No, I'm, we haven't done anything. You're here, you made it. Sí, gracias, gracias a Dios primero que nada, claro. But what are you going to do now? Me dirijo hacia Cali. Ahí es en donde me le van a ofrecer la ayuda a la niña. Ve cómo tal. She's been told a clinic there will help treat baby Ruth. Good luck. Gracias. Good luck. <laughs> gracias. <Okay. laughs> It seems they've let everybody through now, and it shows the madness that's going on here, where the soldiers are told to stop people and then told to let them through. I think they can't cope with the scale of this and the humanitarian need. I head back into no man's land to see how Venezuelans are crossing the border. 
These tracks are controlled by one of Colombia's biggest drug cartels, the Gulf Clan. They were originally set up as smuggling routes, but these days they're one of the few ways people without official papers can get from one country to the other. Our guide works for the cartel. He's taking us to meet a group of refugees they're bringing in over the border. But we're being watched closely by his men, out of sight. We start to meet people who've just made us across. This is really come out with whatever you can carry, because it's your only chance. More than two million people have fled poverty, hunger and medical shortages in Venezuela. And almost half of those are children and young people under 18, many coming in on their own. Right now, it is the largest migration in the world. This is essentially what sits between Venezuela and Colombia. And it really is the Wild West because the land either side of this water is controlled by a combination of criminal gangs on the Colombian side and Venezuelan colectivos. They are the, the political thugs, if you like, who are now hand in hand with organized crime, getting goods and people across the river and out of Venezuela. And the crisis has torn many families apart. Hi, how are you doing? What, what's your name? Yo Elvis. Yo Elvis Abreu. Yo Elvis. How long has it taken you to come here? Tengo aproximadamente 15 días en en la lucha pues desde Caracas hacia acá. He's just 17, traveling with his aunt Bonice, who's only a few years older. No tenemos sed y no hemos tomado ni agua. And why are you leaving Venezuela? Tengo mi mamá en Perú, voy camino hacia allá y caminando, o sea, pidiendo cola como vaya así poco a poco. Each person prepared to risk this crossing has to hand over $30 to the cartel. That's over a year's pay if you're on Venezuela's minimum wage. But the boys know it could all lead to nothing if their guide can't get them out of here. They're trying to find their way around because they've come up against a police border patrol and they're worried that it's going to turn them back. Tell me a little bit more about what life is like in Venezuela at the moment. Y estando allá esperando morirme de hambre porque es lo que es lo que le está pasando a la mayoría de las personas allá. No no puede salir a la calle con nada porque nada va de nada, sino por cualquier cosa te arrancan la vida. Joe Elvis's school friend, Everson, is also hoping to find his mother. He's just a teenager too, but already has a baby son he's had to leave behind in Caracas. Why did your mother go to Chile? We trek for over an hour through no man's land, still with our guide. Finally, the illegal track brings us out into the Colombian town of Cucuta. A scramble under a door, and they've made it. What are you feeling? Una felicidad grande. A pesar de todo que también me encuentro con los sentimientos que dejan mis hijas, pero estoy feliz. Cucuta has become a staging post for thousands like them. Having spent all they had getting this far, they're starving, so we buy them lunch. The difference between this and life in Venezuela is hitting them fast.
Un plato así, pues. Un almuerzo. Pollo, carne, día sin comer. Feliz. Tell me about your life in Venezuela. Did you have a job? What did you do? Estaba desempleado porque me conseguía trabajo. Mi mamá me ayudó a mantener a mi hijo. Pero después yo comencé a conseguir un empleo. El sueldo no alcanzaba para nada. Tuvimos que abandonar los estudios para ponernos a trabajar. Y ahora, bueno, ya que ni trabajo conseguíamos, nos tocó. Do you have any money in your pockets? Me quedaron esta monedita. Pesos. Y es 200, 200 pesos. 200 pesos. Yes. So, this is about five pence, six cents in US dollars. And that's everything they've got between them. But they're going to need hundreds of dollars each for bus tickets to Chile and Peru. Determined to find work, they hit the streets. Bonis was a nurse in Venezuela, but now any job will do. I leave them as their search for work continues. All along the border, people are just pouring in. They're just coming up onto the main road from these illegal tracks and boarding these cooperative buses, they're called, trying to get into town and as far away as they can. Amongst this tide of families escaping Venezuela are many children arriving on their own. Jesus is 16, his friend Jefferson just 14. They say their parents couldn't afford to feed them anymore, so they left school and came here alone. How much money do you make? 10, 15 pesos lo máximo. Each time? Diario. Is that enough to live? Sobreviviendo aquí, sí. O sea, no es suficiente, pero para comer, para algo. Yo le metí el corazón de la buena. Is this what you thought Colombia was going to be like? Es otro, otro, otro vínculo, pe. They came in search of a new life, but they're making just enough to stay alive. I'm meeting up with 16-year-old Yulimar. She also came to Colombia looking for work. Her only link to friends and family is through Facebook, when she has enough money to pay the internet cafe. How do you feel when you look at these pictures? Do you think you're a child or an adult? Without papers to work legally, Yulimar has struggled to find a job. That night, I arranged to see her again. Like many young Venezuelan girls here, she started selling sex on the street. Prostitution is legal in Colombia, but only if you're over 18. Do the clients know that you're only 16? What you're doing is illegal. So how do you avoid being in trouble with the police? Ah, cuando llevar a policía salgo corriendo con él porque imagínate qué más puedo hacer. 
What was your dream coming to Colombia? Bueno, yo mi sueño era encontrar un trabajo decente, ¿me entiendes? O sea, tan siquiera cuidando niños, lo que sea. Yo venía. It's dangerous work, but for now she feels it's all she can do to survive. A few streets away, Jesus and Jefferson are still trying to make a few pennies to eat tonight. Cuando me vine para acá, por una parte mi mamá me decía que estaba más aliviada, pero que le dijera que cómo estaba y eso, yo para no tormentar le decía que estaba bien, que ya por lo menos comía y eso, no andaba robando ni nada. And do you speak to her? Sí. Claro, y usted sabe, lloramos. Ay, mamá, me hace falta. For Jesus and Jefferson, it's hard to see what future there is. When you see them trying to go to sleep on a hard road with just a little bit of cardboard as a bed, they really do look like the little kids they are. The streets in this town are full of Venezuelan families with nothing. There's no help or shelter. I've never seen this many people sleeping rough on the streets outside of a natural disaster or a war zone. And it's no wonder that people now believe that the migration of people from Venezuela into Colombia is the biggest mass movement of people since the Syrian war. These people are trapped many with young children trying to scrape enough to build a future. I'm heading back to meet the boys and their aunt I met earlier at the border. They've had some luck. Joelvis, Everson and Bonice have found a place to sleep tonight. A Venezuelan couple have taken them in. Hola. How did you know each other? Ah, ya abajo yo los vi a ellos que venían como desesperados porque no tenían donde dormir. Will they be able to stay with you? Sí, claro. O sea, yo digo es que bueno, yo les voy a dar chance que consigan trabajo para que nos ayuden a pagar el arriendo. Porque el señor dueño de la casa nos pide cinco mil pesos por persona. And do you think the boys will be able to make some money here? Yeah, ah, sí, sí, con eso es que yo puedo trabajar aquí, puedo estar aquí en Colombia. Nelson's family arrived last year when it was easier to get a work permit. Do you have any ID cards? No tenemos no. eso. No. Did you realize all of this that it was going to be quite hard when you get here? Sí, sí, claro, rudo está, pero que hay que estar porque para adelante es para allá, pues, porque hay que salir adelante. De trabajar lo que sea, pues, lo que vengan. But they're already in debt to their new friends, whose landlord will want paying. The job hunt begins again. Jefe, me está buscando uno que lo ayude a recoger ese monte. Ah, ok. Si yo consigo un dueño de negocio. Claro, es que en los negocios te piden muchos papeles. Sí, esa es la otra. But in a town full of illegal immigrants, who will want to hire a couple of kids and their aunt? Todavía no me voy rendido. And how about you, Joe Elvis? 
ya, ya de regreso no, no puedo, pues, no, no, no encuentro opción de regresarme. We head back to the house that evening, but they have no money to pay the rent. Could you just explain to us what's happened? Sí, ellos se quieren quedar también. O sea, lo único es que aquí todo el mundo tiene que pagar por dormir. This must be very difficult for you as well. La cuestión no crea que usted nosotros vinimos para acá a ser millonarios. Nosotros también somos venezolanos. Bueno, no fue a comer prácticamente, más nada. Okay. It's a really brutal situation. I mean, and not what at all what I was expecting. I have to say, um, they didn't make any money today. They didn't get a job. They've come back empty-handed and they've got to leave and it's going to be dark quite soon and i don't know where they're going to go no sé qué voy a hacer la policía no puede agarrar y no pueden devolver para venezuela hubiera solución en venezuela me fuera acá en venezuela pero in Venezuela, estaba pasando más trabajo de lo que pasaba aquí. How are you feeling, Joel? De verdad, de verdad, estoy sin palabras. Cada, cada día siento que, que estoy más solo por la vida. Porque mi mamá está en otro lado. No cuento con ella ni nada, pero yo sé que en algún momento me voy a volver a conseguir con ella para que. Vamos a conseguir con ella, mano, tranquilo, tranquilo, vale, que no, vamos a conseguirnos con ella. Estoy tranquilo, mano, que... quédate tranquilo. Todo en esta vida me sale mal. Yo no me considero ni una persona mala. Nosotros no vamos para otra parte. They came here with no money, and they have no way of making money because they don't have the legal paperwork, and they are children. And they just don't know what they're going to do. And that was the question hanging over Iberson and Joe Elvis from the moment I met them. How on earth are they going to survive? And tonight, they have no idea. It is hard to understand why people would choose this to sleep rough, living hand to mouth. But every Venezuelan I met said they'd still rather be here than back home. At least here, there is hope. On unreported world, desperate decisions for those sent back from the United States to one of the world's deadliest countries, El Salvador. With the gangs in charge, a simple tattoo can brand you as the enemy and prevent you from making a new life. Deportation can be a death sentence, so should they stay and brave it or try to get back to their American dream, where being caught again could mean years in prison? It's about nine o'clock at night and we're following the police to the scene of a shooting. In El Salvador, someone is killed every few hours. 
there's a turf war between two gangs, MS-13 and 18th Street, and the police. We're on our way to the latest shooting. They say some of their officers came under fire from a gang. They returned fire and killed one of them. The police are taking us into an area of the capital, San Salvador, that's controlled by MS-13, who could attack at any moment. No one's talking. MS-13 has a strict code. Watch, listen, and keep your mouth shut. There's clearly some family of the person who has been shot dead and uh, an older family member who is sobbing away just behind me. And it's a very nervous scene here and the police look pretty jumpy too. The police say the man shot at them, so they killed him. There's a very tense situation here now. The family have moved away, but there is a boy here who we believe is the dead man's nephew. And he's only 13 or 14 years old, and he's very, very upset and has been muttering, I want to kill the police. Solo estamos esperando este apoyo por la cuestión de que eh, como eh, cuando así la pandilla pierde un miembro, muchas veces buscan la venganza. Aproximadamente 16, 16 años, un joven. Pues la verdad que para la familia sí es una tragedia. Lamentablemente el joven es reconocido pandillero de este sector. Gang-related killings have made El Salvador one of the world's deadliest countries. La calle Rubén Darío nuevamente se tiñó de sangre. But this is where President Trump is sending thousands of Salvadoran deportees, many of whom went to the US to escape the violence decades ago. Most come back to live with relatives in dangerous neighborhoods in a country they barely know. It means quickly learning the gang's rules, including their extortion rackets and control over exactly who comes in and out. We're only safe in this street for a few minutes, and that's with an armed police escort. Areas like this in El Salvador are completely controlled by the gangs. They know everybody who lives here, they know who doesn't belong, and all the businesses in this area are being extorted, they're being taxed. Big public places like shopping malls are among the few spaces people feel relatively safe from the gangs. Meeting me here is a man who was deported last year from Texas. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Rene tells me about the life he built in America over 14 years, working in a souvenir shop to support the son he's had to leave behind. Why did you go to the States when you were a kid? Because, um, my dad got killed. How did that happen? Gang members. Principio, cuando empiezas, ellos quieren que te unas a su pandilla, y si tú no te unes, they kill all your family. When Rene's father was killed, his family paid people smugglers to get the boy to America. As a young man, he got caught up in a fight. He says it was self-defense but he was jailed for five years for assault and upon release was deported. Now back at his mother's home, the gang controls his life completely. And you have to pay the gangs now just to live here? If you don't pay, you know what's gonna happen. It's not easy. It's not easy, bro, but that's why I want to go back. Meeting Rene is giving me a real sense of how deportees face terrible choices. Trying to resist joining the gangs can get you or your family killed. La televisión salvadoreña. Un hombre fue asesinado sobre la calle Amatillo de la colonia El Progreso en el municipio de Mexicanos. El cadáver presentaba dos lesiones de arma de fuego en la cabeza. The MS-13 and 18th Street gangs began in the United States, 
formed by immigrants fleeing El Salvador's civil war in the 1980s. Ever since, as people have been deported over the years, they've brought those gangs to El Salvador. I'm headed to one place where I can talk to gang members without them or me risking our lives. In prison. San Francisco Gotera is a jail for 18th Street gang members. Former inmate Wilfredo Gomez is taking me in to meet deportees like him who ended up joining the gang. He's now helping them prepare for life on the outside. So, Wilfredo, why, why were you sent here? Um, well, I was put in here because um, I got arrested for strong arm robbery while I um, was living out here in El Salvador. And um, I got caught and I got sentenced to 10 years. So when you got to this jail, what was it like? They have a lot of gangs that are violent within the prisons. It was terrible. They just had a massacre. Mm. Wilfredo lived in Los Angeles with his family before being deported in 2006. How did you come to be deported? Uh, I ended up getting involved in gangs. Being a gang member was like the thing to do, you know. You had popularity, acceptance, you know. How easy is it to avoid the gangs when you get out? It ain't easy at all. It ain't easy. Especially if you're marked. If you have a tattoo on you, there's no way you could avoid them. And it's still a problem for Wilfredo. So where are your tattoos? Can I see them? Of course. So that's the 18? Yes. Wilfredo's childhood friend, Orlando, joined 18th Street with him as teenagers in L.A. When Orlando was also deported, his tattoos made it impossible to hide his gang history. You arrived in this country with a big 18 on your face. So did you have any choice but to join the gang? So I was coming in the plane and, and I, was, I was nervous because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go, especially me having the tattoo on my face. And I, I was like, man, what am I going to do? I didn't have nobody for me over here because I left this country when I was five years old. So when I came back here, I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. Uh, I actually felt that I needed to look for the gang because uh, I knew that if I went to a wrong place, I most likely I was going to end up dead. So you didn't really have any choice? Yeah, I didn't have no choice. We've only been in El Salvador a few days, and there have already been reports of dozens of murders. In between two neighborhoods controlled by these rival gangs sits La Chacra. It's the arrivals lounge for deportees fresh off the plane from the US. Donald Trump's immigration crackdown has seen an increase in deportations of undocumented migrants who haven't committed crimes. Hundreds arrive each week, removed for not being able to prove they were in the U.S. legally. They were all born in El Salvador, but many were taken to America as children by parents escaping the Civil War. They have no memory of life here. Most are too scared to talk to us. But one person wants to share his story. I lived in the state of Maryland. I had my wife, two children, I had a business. Why are you afraid to show your face? For the pandillas that there are in this country. I lost a brother because of the pandillas. Have you got any criminal convictions in the States? No. He tells me he flew back here after 14 years in the States to get the paperwork required to apply for U.S. residency but his application was rejected, so he tried to cross the border illegally. He was caught and deported today. Do you think you'll ever make it back to the States? No. Si uno es deportado la primera vez, y de entras ilegalmente otra vez, ahí te arresta y te vuelven a deportar. No sé qué es lo que me espera aquí ahorita. Thank
Pablo Blanco Molina. It's been a couple of hours since we arrived and I've talked to a lot of people in the room, but it's very striking. People are afraid to speak to us because of what will happen to them when they get out of here and the gangs find out. Later that evening, I'm about to learn how deportees can find themselves suddenly on the wrong side of the gangs without realizing. I'm meeting the sister of 21-year-old Henry Ayala. Hi, Chris. Henry's family say he was deported from the US after unpaid speeding tickets prompted a check on his immigration status. He disappeared soon after arriving here. Henry's sister is too scared to show her face. Tell me about the day Henry disappeared. Cuando vino aquí, él por medio de una vecina conoció a dos amigos, sí, a lo que son una clica de MS. What do you believe happened to him? Que las personas lo lo desaparecieron. Quizás pudiera ser cosas malas como ellos que mi hermano no quiso. Pues le pasó eso. On average, over the last five years, one deportee has been killed every month. La televisión salvadoreña. La víctima tenía varios tatuajes, algunos de ellos alusivos a las pandillas. I'm meeting Rene again. He's sure the gangs will kill him just as they killed his father, if he doesn't escape. So he's made a big decision. And do you have a rucksack? Uh, what backpack. Happened? Oh, backpack, yes. You've got one, yeah. Rene's heard of a caravan, a large group of migrants traveling to the US border. He's decided to join it and is shopping for supplies. How much walking do you think you'll have to do and how much on the bus? Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but they say like they, we're going to walk the whole way, all the way to Tijuana. So really? it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us like about 30 to 40 days. Around one in five people deported from the United States try to make it back illegally. If Rene is caught, he could spend years in jail before being deported again to El Salvador. It's risky what you're doing, isn't it, going on the caravan? Yeah, very risky. So why are you doing it? I have to. I don't have another way. You know, I live 40 years over there, and now to go back over here, no se nada, o sea, I'm like a stranger over here. It's like being in jail. While Rene is desperate to leave, Wilfredo has committed to staying in El Salvador and helping other deportees escape the gangs. In the jail where he discovered a way out of gang violence just last year, Wilfredo. he's showing me how he now persuades others right. to take the same so, route. This is the miracle. This is the miracle. Wilfredo found God in jail and now comes back to spread the word. The church is uniquely respected by the gangs, so they leave Wilfredo alone now he's out of jail. The whole prison seems to be learning from his lesson. How did the whole prison become Christian? I guess I was like a testimony to them. You know, if someone that came from the United States, that's supposed to be a hardcore gang member, could turn into Christianity and change his life, then anyone else could. Is being a Christian now the only way out of a gang? Yeah, it's either Christianity or a black bag, plastic bag. That's it.
The next morning, Wilfredo tells me to meet him at an office block to visit a call center. They're one of the biggest growth businesses in El Salvador, crying out for English speakers. Eleven. Yeah. He's with Freddy, another deportee who got out of prison last week, who's trying to go straight and get a job here. So do many people from the prison get taken on? I have helped out people before and um, they're still working, they back with their families. They started a new life, they have kids, they become Salvadorian citizens. But the manager seems to be having doubts. Everything Freddie is wearing shouts gang member. Change your dress code, change your style. I'll tell you because definitely that's going to take you a long way. You may not feel comfortable. Yeah. It may feel weird at times. But hey, it's really worth changing. Okay? You're welcome. Okay. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This you got to change your shoes. Yeah, shoes, uh, I think. That shirt got to go. That hat got to go. Yeah. Uh, the lobes got to go. The <laughs> necklace got to go. I mean. Yeah, next time I'll come, I'll come a little bit more decent. Uh, you got to dress way different over here. Freddie didn't get this job, but he's learned a lesson for next time. Wilfredo well, has his own image problem. He has two small 18th Street tattoos on his face that give away the gang history he's left behind. He wants to get rid of them, but there's a long waiting list for tattoo removal. Without the same belief in God that gives Wilfredo an invincible confidence, René is simply terrified and feels he has no choice but to flee the country again. I wanted to go and see René at his house, but he says it's far too dangerous for us to go over there and there are gang members everywhere. So he sent me a video message. René is planning for every eventuality. Before René heads out with the caravan, I've just got time to catch up with Wilfredo. He's had some good news. He's got an appointment today at the government-run clinic to have his face tattoos removed. This little small tattoo, I'm gonna try to get it removed, so I gotta shave before I go in there. And what does it say? 8th Street. When did you get that done? When I was 14 years old. I don't wanna be flashing them out here, you know? Any little bit of ink they see, right away they could just spot you out. Okay, that's it. Shall I take a snap of it? That's the uh, 18th Street gone. Yeah. What does LA mean here? Oh, that means that I'm, I'm from the States and I'm a target for everyone. For them, it's like a bigger mission to take out a deportee. Do you have friends who've been killed that way? Yes, many. Removing the tattoos seems to have given Wilfredo a new clarity of how much his gang life has cost him. What does getting rid of this mean to you? It's actually wiping away the mistakes that I made. It caused so much pain in me. Lost my family, lost my kid, lost my life. Do you think you'll ever get a chance to go back to America? No. 
I was deported for life. It's not worth it, you know, crossing the border, being charged, getting in trouble, probably getting a bunch of years and then coming back again. But Rene believes it's worth the risk. It's a heartbreaking goodbye for his mother. Unsure when or if she'll see him again. Around 250 people leave El Salvador every day, many of them, like René, chancing their luck with the caravans heading to America. He's joining a huge group of people, gathering for a daunting 3,000-mile journey. What did your mother say? Don't leave. It's sad, you know. It broke my heart, but what can I do? You feel optimistic? Kind of tired. I'm thinking a lot of stuff. I gotta think if the money is enough. Si tengo agua. Si voy a tener frío. As well as escaping the gangs, Rene has another growing reason to get back to America. How important is it to you to see your son? Yeah. He's growing up. Trato ahora o mi hijo va a crecer y y nunca me va a conocer. If they stop you at the border, the U.S. border, what happens? Jail. Jail. I even feel like more safe in jail than over here. <laughs> Life is a risk. O sea, no sé si voy a regresar vivo. It's obvious why families are joining the caravan. There is safety in numbers, and when they get to the border, many of them are happy to hand themselves in and try to claim asylum. But if you're a deportee from the United States, if you're caught at the border, you will be thrown in jail, and at the end of several years in prison, you will be deported again. So people like René are taking a big risk. The flow of deportees coming the other way is expected to grow. President Trump says he'll deport another 200,000 next year, many facing the same hard choices as René and Wilfredo.